Hi, this is version 2 of the video about the difference between what flat earthers think Coriolis is and what it actually is. There was some valid criticism on the first video, so I decided to make some improvements. This involved rewriting the code generating the animations, some of which I did live. The recording is available if you are curious. Just to be clear, what I intend to address is the understanding of the Coriolis effect many flat earthers seem to share which is that it is the surface drifting underneath objects, whether that's the Earth's surface or the surface of a merry-go-round. Now, the Coriolis effect is sometimes described as the surface drifting underneath, but the details here are important. Flat earthers seem to think that if the Earth is rotating, then an object on the equator should see the Earth's surface moving at 465 meters per second, or about 1000 miles per hour, the moment it loses contact with the surface. And just to show some evidence that this isn't only a strawman I'm building, here are some comments from flat earthers indicating that they indeed understand it this way. Brian's logic even did the whole video on this topic, which also supports my understanding of what they are claiming. So, the first animation will show how, in my understanding, flat earthers imagine the Earth's rotation is supposed to work. In my first video I used a ball thrown vertically upwards for the example. This time I intend to use a ball dropped freely from an altitude. The reason for this change should become clear later in the video. Let's play the video. We'll be looking at the rotating Earth from an inertial reference frame, so everything in our view will be rotating. The ball will be dropped the moment the dark green line, indicating the vertical at the point where the ball is held, passes the center of the screen. Also note the arrows. The dark green one represents the force of gravity, and the red one is the velocity of the ball. So let's go. You can see the ball moving with the vertical line until, when it is dropped, it loses all the horizontal speed and the ground starts drifting underneath it at 465 meters per second. If you look at the tangential velocity indicator though, you'll see it's actually bigger. This is because the ball is at a large altitude. In this example I'm actually dropping it from 2000 kilometers up, and in rotational motion points farther from the center move at larger speeds. So while the points on the equator move at 465 meters per second, the points 2000 kilometers up move faster, about four thirds the speed of the surface. And while we're at it, a small note. While I did use realistic values for the simulation, like the Earth's radius of 6371 kilometers and the angular speed of one rotation every 23 hours 56 minutes, I decreased the Earth's mass by a factor of 20 in order to make some aspects of the problem clearer. With a realistic mass, the ball was falling so fast that the effects of rotation were barely visible. As for the time scale, every frame corresponds to a time step of 25 seconds. Alright, back to the video. Let the ball drop. You can see that while it's falling, the surface is drifting away underneath it as per flat earther's descriptions. Then, once it falls, you can see it fell quite far to the west from the point directly below where it was released. Let's look at this again, but now let the camera rotate slowly along with the Earth. This is what an observer rotating with the Earth would see. You can see that the ball seems to get launched violently to the side when it is dropped, because that's actually what such a drop would correspond to. If this stuff worked the way flat earthers seem to think it does, everything released freely should magically start moving at ludicrous speeds. But note that the path and the velocity vectors were also still drawn as in the inertial ref reference frame. Let's fix this and switch to a full view from a rotating frame. Note this time that two additional arrows will appear. One, light green, will be the centrifugal force, and another, cyan one, will be the Coriolis force. In order to get consistent results, we need to include these forces in the rotating frame. I demonstrated this in a bit more detail during my livestream mentioned earlier. So we see that once again the ball gets launched to the west when it is released, then falls far west from the point where it was initially. Only now the forces are different, and the track looks different too. But actually the motion of the ball in these two animations is exactly the same. Let me prove it to you by playing a version where the two are overlaid on one another.
Cool, so that is the Flat Earther's view covered. Let's now move on to what this is actually like. As Rachi correctly pointed out in her recent videos, when Flat Earthers are pointing out that we don't see the drift, they are arguing with a strawman. We Globers do not claim that if the Earth is rotating then everything should get launched to the west when let go. There is such a thing as inertia and conservation of momentum, and things keep their momentum when being let go. So let's see what this all looks like when we take this into account. This video is the same as the first one, only the ball doesn't stop mid-air when it is dropped. It keeps its horizontal velocity, but starts gaining a vertical component. But as we can see, it only seems to move along the vertical line for a brief moment, then it starts deviating, to the east. And this is exactly why I chose to use this example instead. You see, when using a ball launched vertically, it also deviated from vertical and it also deviated to the west. Hence Flatzoid claiming that I considered that the Earth moves under the ball. Sure, the deviation in a vertical launch seems to also fit the Earth moving under the ball picture, until one looks at the numbers. Even in my simulations in the last video, you could see that the actual deviation is much less than the flat earthers imagine, but you couldn't see how big the difference is, which could have led Flatzoid to thinking that it's insignificant. Well, it's not. As I've pointed out in the comment thread under Flatzoid's post, if this worked the way flat earthers think, then a ball launched 10 meters into the air should get deflected by almost 1400 meters before falling. The actual expected deflection from Coriolis in such a case, when we take the proper physics into account, is a bit less than 3 millimeters. That's 500,000 times less. But the difference becomes glaringly obvious when a ball gets dropped from some altitude. Then the actual expected deviation is to the east, which can't be explained just by the Earth rotating underneath, when it also rotates to the east. Hence my choice. Let's do the same as before and look at it from the point of view of a rotating camera. And again, with the trail, velocity and forces also drawn relative to the rotating observer. So again, the centrifugal and Coriolis forces also make an appearance. And once again, just to show you that the motion is actually still the same, here are the two overlaid on one another. Right, so I hope I made myself clear this time. This is the difference between what flat earthers seem to imagine and what the globe claim actually is. What we claim cannot be simply reduced to the earth rotating underneath, as it leads to predictions that are simply wrong. And before someone argues that the globe predictions are wrong as well because we don't see the deflection to the east, well, actually in proper experiment experiments we do like the famous one done in a mineshaft in Schlebusch in 1803, where iron pebbles were dropped from a height of 90 meters. The results matched a theoretical prediction, which you can see in the form of a cross right in the middle of the cluster of hits. Ah, and one more thing. Sleeping Warrior seems to insist that for the Coriolis effect two reference frames are required, in his words. Here he justified it by saying that without a second reference frame you can't prove that the motion was actually a straight line. Well, in the case of a ball being dropped, the fall isn't along a straight line in either reference frame. In the inertial frame it's actually along an ellipse, and in the non-inertial frame it becomes some other curve. So how about that? Thanks for watching and see you in the next one.